Well, firstly, this acknowledgement. Yes. So thank you very much to everyone who has uh, joined us for our uh, concurrent session of uh, the REC1, which is really has a very big in, in emphasis on evolution, biodiversity, and, and wonderfully a lot on marine science. So as you all realize, five of the six speakers are in, in the domain of the, the aquatic domain. But just to start off with some house rules. So uh, we, we have two sessions in which uh, each of the speakers is uh, given 15 minutes to uh, present their, their paper. So uh, I, Mikey and I will take turns in uh, giving a brief uh, bio sketch of each of our speakers. And uh, I think we, it's divided into two sessions. So the first uh, half, we have the, the, the first three speakers and then we will give 10 minutes for Q and A. And then we continue with the next uh, three speakers and uh, we have the Q&A too. And if, if there are any other uh, questions that arise and we still have time, then we have that opportunity. But I think we're all used to Zoom nowadays. So when we uh, arrive at the questions and answers, if, if you just all press the, uh, the button and the Zoom to, to raise your, your hand up and then th there will be a queue and then we will, we will ask you to speak, your, speak out your questions and the speakers will respond to them. But firstly, I, I forgot to say that the, the uh, uh, chairs for this session is uh, Professor Mikey Roleda at MSI and me and Augustin Doranula from the University of Melbourne. So I think we can start now with, with Dr. Reyes. So I just want to make a brief introduction of Dr. Cecilia Reyes. So Dr. Cecilia Reyes is an entomologist with extensive experience in academia, research extension, project coordination, and senior management in both government and non-government organizations for over 25 years. And Dr. Reyes has said she, she's just happy, happily retired, but she's very active in a lot of things. So Dr. Reyes is an authority on Philippine trips, which she will describe in her talk. And she has published extensively in both international and national journals. And her scientific contributions include discoveries and descriptions of nine genera and 42 species of insects. We're happy to say that she has just been recently recognized as a 2021 Southeast Asian woman leader in the cohort of women leaders in agriculture, science, and education. And her talk is titled Molecular Identification and Abundance of Trips on Cavendish Banana in Tree Plantations in Dabao del Norte, Philippines. So I think uh, Mikey will switch on as a pre-recorded talk because of the risk of uh, the internet failing. And then uh, Dr. Reyes will be present with us. So thank you very much. I am Cecilia Reyes, and my presentation is on molecular identification and abundance of drips on Cavendish banana in tree plantations in Davao del Norte, Philippines. My co-authors in this study are Barbara Calvili, Roderick Granada, Mario Humamoy, Benny Corcolon, Daniela Pamulaklakin, and Junel Guzman. The Philippines is the second largest exporter of Cavendish banana in the world. And this variety is grown mainly in Mindanao for domestic and export markets. The bulk of the fresh produce come from Region 11 or Dabao region particularly in the province of Davao del Norte, which is dubbed as the banana capital of the Philippines. The Tagum Development Corporation, or TADECO, has thousands of hectares of Cavendish banana grown in Panabo City 
and in several towns of Davao del Norte. The company is engaged in the production and export of banana to Japan, China, Korea, Middle East, Russia, Hong Kong, Malaysia, and Singapore under the Del Monte and the Dole brand names. Cavendish banana are attacked by very small piercing sucking insects commonly known as strips or colicipsip. They feed on leaves, flowers, and young fruits. Adult trips and larvae are usually found aggregated under banana bracts and inside flowers or florets. The feeding and oviposition injury of trips result to the formation of florets and water soak appearance and brown scab in banana fingers that affect the quality and marketability of the fruit. The trips is morphologically similar to trips hawaiensis, an invasive species of ASEAN or Pacific origin and pest of mango, pomelo, coffee, and tea in the Philippines. The existing method to control trips in Tadeco plantations are chemical control, which is the use of insecticides for flower bud spraying, flower bud injection, banana buns and bud spraying. But of course, there are several health concerns there for plantation workers and uh, the problem with the compliance with the insecticide maximum residue limit to the importing country or market of destination. Uh, the other control is peeping or emerging flower bud bugging using plastic bugs. But again, there are some issues there, especially that plastic is non-biodegradable. Um, and the other one is mechanical, which is the removal of the male flower or bell once all banana hands are exposed. Now, this is just to show you that some of our export are destroyed because of that pesticide residue. Um, the estimated losses in the Tadeco plantation alone is because they have so much hectares, no? Our plantation is like 130 million per year. And for the chemical, a bad injection and for peeping bad bugging is about 17 million per year. That was in 2018. And there's an additional cost of about 7 million per year just to monitor trips because they have to destroy the banana plant. Uh, the objective of this study is to identify trips in Pasting Grand 9, Toll Williams, and GCTCV218 cultivars using molecular technique, uh, determine the abundance of trips in Panabo City, Carmen, and Biidohali cabin displantations during wet and dry season, and to determine the effect of temperature and rainfall to the population of trips on three cabin cultivars in three plantations. Uh, trips survey was conducted in August 2020 and November 2020 for the wet season, and March 2021 and May 2021 for the dry season using purposive sampling technique. 15 flowering plants per cultivar per plantation or a total of 45 plants per plantation were used as samples. 50 female trips per cultivar per plantation were sent to the University of the Philippines Los Banos for DNA extraction and for uh, DNA sequencing to the Nubulab Asia Corporation in Quezon City. Uh, based on the mitochondrial cytochrome Z oxidase one marker, 
trip samples had a significant match with trips Hawaiiansis Morgan, having 100% queer recover with 99.24 to 0.99.70% nucleotide. Uh, trips Hawaiiansis belongs to order Tysanoptera under the family Tripidae. In the Panabo City Plantation, female trips were dominant in the plantation and their November 2020 count increased to about 1.9 times in May 2021, while male trips counts were low, but increased rapidly to about 5.6 times in May 2021. Uh, four pupae were collected on granine. Now, analysis of variance between the men counts of females, males, and second N star larvae showed no significant difference, but there was a significant difference between the mean counts of females and first N star larvae. There was also no significant difference between the mean counts of trips on Gran 9, Paul Williams, and GCTCV 218 during wet and dry season. In B.E. Duhali plantation, female trips were dominant in the plantation, and their November 2020 count increased to about 1.8 times in May 2021 while male trips count increased rapidly or about 4.8 times in May 2021. No pupa was collected. Now analysis of variance between the mean counts of females and males, first instar larvae and second instar larvae showed a significant difference. Again, there was no significant difference between the mean counts of trips on grand nine Williams and GCTCB218 during wet and dry season. In Carmen Plantation, female trips were dominant in the plantation and their November 2020 counts increased about 1.4 times in May 2021 while male trips counts were low, but increased rapidly to about 7.8 times in May 2021. No pupa was collected. Now analysis of variance between the mean counts of females, males, first instar larvae and second instar larvae showed a significant difference. Again, there was no significant difference between the mean counts of trips on Grand 9, Paul Williams, and GCTCV218 during wet and dry season. Um, the maximum temperature in the study sites during the survey ranged from 26 degrees Celsius to 36 degrees Celsius, and the average amount of rainfall ranged from 0 to 1.5 millimeter. In August 2020, 3,470 trips were collected on Grand 9, 3,066 on Tall Williams, and 2,818 on GCTC V21A from the three plantations or a total of 9,356. In November 2020, the total number of trips collected in the plantation was 5,943. In March 2021, the total number of trips collected in the three plantations was 9,376. While in May 2021, the total number of trips collected from the three plantations was 11,386. Now, the regression analysis between maximum temperature and total counts of trips Hawaiiansis on Grand 9, Tall Williams, and GCTCD with 218 
in Panabo City, Biduhali, and Carmen plantations showed the trips counts were positively correlated with temperature, which means that as the temperature increases, trips population increases. The, the regression analysis between average rainfall and total counts of trips Hawaiiensis on Grand 9, Tall Williams, and GCTCV 218 cultivars in Panabo City, Biidohali, and Carmen plantations were negatively correlated with rainfall, which means that when the amount of rainfall increases, trips population decreases. Now, the dominance of female trips in the plantations could be due to facultative partenogenesis. That is the ability of a sexually reproducing insect species to sometimes produce offspring asexually. Male trips population was slow during the wet season, but increased rapidly during the dry season. Now under laboratory condition, the unfertilized eggs of trips hawaiensis reared on saba banana florets gave rise to both male and female individuals, or we call that Deuterotoki. Now, Deuterotoki is a type of partenogenesis when the unfertilized eggs of insects develop into either male or female individuals. And Waldi Milak believed that this is a result of inbreeding between brother and sister. Now, in this study, the whitish and bean shaped eggs were not counted for, they were inserted singly in plant tissue using female trips, so like ovipositor. Um, the scarcity of the pupa in the field, this is at the non feeding stage of trips. Uh, this is due to the fact that mature second and star larvae usually drop to the ground to undergo pupation. Now, Trips Hawaiiensis population were positively correlated with temperature and neg negatively correlated with rainfall. Now, these findings support many uh, previous studies that the development of the different life stages of trips had significant linear relationship with temperature, while rainfall caused a significant decrease in the number of trips remaining on the plant, and trips survivorship was significantly affected by rainfall intensity. Uh, in conclusion, Trips hawaiensis was the only species of trips attacking Cavendish banana in the three plantations of the Deco and Dabo del Norte. Female trips was dominant on three Cavendish cultivars during the wet season and nearly doubled its population during the dry season. Male trips population maintained a low population during the wet season, but increased rapidly or more than five times during the dry season. Grand 9, Tall Williams, and GCTCV218 Cavendish cultivars are all susceptible to trips attack. Trips Hawaiians' populations were positively correlated with temperature and negatively correlated with rainfall. Findings of this study are useful in the development of management program for banana trips. For the recommendation, our we recommend the following uh, to discover and use keromone or pheromone beta drops to manage trips in banana plantations. Uh, we would like to thank our teammates, Dr. Annabel Villalobos, Catherine Copoyo, Jamaica Castillo, Jake Bagaan, Carjan Rimonda for their assistance during the conduct of the study. Um, the study was funded by the Department of Science and Technology under the Collaborative Research and Development to Leverage Philippine Economy or Cradle Program. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dr. Reyes. So I think we can proceed to the next speaker who Mikey will introduce. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, actually an alumni of the Marine Science Institute. And then after his master's, he, he went to uh, Japan to do his PhD. So he obtained his PhD in cell biology from Kochi University. And then uh, he returned to the Philippines as a Balik Scientist Awardee by the DOSD Picard and uh, uh, went to Batanga State University. So now Dr. Sako is the head of the Marine <clears throat> Research Center of Batanga State University, the Verde Island Passage Center for Oceanographic Research and Aquatic Life Sciences. So he's currently a, an assistant professor under the College of Arts and Sciences and the College of Agriculture and Forestry of the same university. So without much ado, let us uh, invite uh, Dr. Sako to present his uh, talk on the ecological and economic uh, important seaweed species that could be found in the Verde Island Passage. Without All much right. ado, please. Thank you, JV. Thank you, Mikey, and um, good morning, everyone. Um, I will be presenting on the notes on some ecological and economically important um, seaweed species in Verde Island Passage. So um, um, with me are my co-researchers um, from the different um, state universities and colleges bordering the Verde Island Passage, um, Mindoro State University, Marinduque State College, um, Occidental Mindoro State College, and Romblon State University. So just a brief background about seaweeds. You know? So seaweeds are marine macrobenthic algae. They are exclusively marine species and they are naked um, to the eye and um, yes, um, can be seen by the eye and usually attached to a substrate. Um, they are photo-oxotrophic organism, um, meaning they could convert light to chemical energy and could acquire nutrient by diffusion. They are believed to be the ancestors of higher plants because they have root stem and leaf-like structures with, um, com in comparison with higher plants. However, they um, do not possess flower or fruits. So um, conveniently, they are categorized based on dominant pigments, um, red, brown, and green seaweeds. Um, so um, another um, um, information, um, seaweeds among, um, is considered among the most popular bioindicator species that could provide information about health status conditions of the marine environment. For example, um, higher diversity of seaweeds and including seagrass community could mostly observed among the pristine environment. Um, on the other hand, opportunistic seaweed species tends to proliferate under nutrient in beach waters with higher irradiance levels. So seaweed provide other um, function um, or services um, both ecologically and economically to us. So they provide food for human consumption and, and to other marine organisms. They provide shelter and spawning and nursing grounds to other marine organisms. And also they provide livelihood for coastal communities through seaweed farming, or they could also harvest um, natural stock. They, and they provide raw materials for important biochemical compounds used in numerous fields, including the industrial, nutra, and pharmaceutical applications. So, however, studies on seaweeds, primarily on assessment and ecophysiology, are very few in the Verde Island Passage, or VIP, which is considered to be the world center of the center of marine shorefish biodiversity. So this um, presentation um, focused on the preliminary identification of some ecological and economically important seaweed species in the Verde Island Passage. 
So parallel, uh, parallel identification was done alongside with the seaweed seagrass assessment using the line transect quadrant method in 10 sites across four provinces in the VIP, including Batangas, Marinduque, Occidental, and Oriental Mindoro, um, representing pristine and disturbed sites during the Northeast monsoon. So this is in connection with our DOSD GIA funded research project entitled the Marine Biodiversity Assessment and Selected Areas Along the Verde Island Passage or M Bio Assess VIP. And it is actually on our second year of implementation. All right, so collected seaweed species were um, as well photographed of their habit and pressed for herbarium and samples were deposited in the VIP Coral's Marine Repository Hub and the herbarium code is Bad State U and this is already been registered in the New York Botanical Garden. So for the results and discussion, so first, um, a, a dominant seaweed species um, were found in Sigman, Abra de Ilog, and Occidental Mindoro, which is Ulva intestinalis, which was uh, previously reported as a bioindicator species of eutrophication. So based on our um, initial observation, the site is located near the mouth of a river um, with a small community resides next to the site. And there is a high sedimentation um, from the mountain um, observed during the survey. So this is the picture of the ulva intestinalis um, that we collected on the site. Another one is a dominant seaweed species. Um, it, it is also a green seaweed as um, previously, um, as, uh, as similar with the previous um, um, species, which is a green seaweed as well. So this is um, observed in Sabang Puerto Galera in the Occidental, uh, in Oriental Mindoro, which is a ketomorpha Velardii. Um, actually, this is the um, the correct um, name of this species, as uh, previously known as Ketomorpha crassa. So, um, similarly, um, it is previously reported as bioindicator species of eutrophication as well. So, based on our observation, initial observation in site, um, um, the site the site is located in a tourist highly touristed area with um, yeah lot of hotels and other establishment and significantly uh, most of their septic tanks are exposed and we also observe um, in some of the pristine um, sites that we have um, there is a dominant sea, um, species which is a brown seaweed um, padina species and this is also uh, previously reported as um, to be a bioindicator as well but um, this species is very tricky because um, this species could thrive on a um, high nutrient and low nutrient um, water so um, it, it could be um, both um, indicate if the um, site um, has a high nutrient and could be um, indicate a low nutrient um, site. So we have um, um, one more. We have um, a very interesting find um, with this um, type of um, seaweed, with, which is a green calcified seaweed, Numeris annulata, um, which is observed in almost all sites. And we are um, hypothesizing that it could be a good model species for studying the effects of ocean acidification in the VIP. As you may know, that seaweed are the winners um, with um, the changing environment or climate change. And um, since um, um, one of the effects is ocean acidification, it could um, this could be a, a, a possible model model species since this is a calcified seaweed species and. Um, as I've mentioned a while ago, uh, we observed um, this species to be present in almost all of our sampling sites. All right, um, aside from um, their ecological um, importance, um, um, I'll be presenting to you um, um, some seaweed species with potential for cultivation were also identified and culture of this um, um, seaweed species could be a source of livelihood for um, coastal population in the VIP. For example, this one, this is Asparagopsis taxiformis. So it is um, 
a feed supplement for methane reduction in cattle. So it is um, observed to have an antioxidative property, antimicrobial, antifungal, anticoagulant, which prevents um, blood clots, and anti-methanogenic, as um, it is being used for methane reduction in cattle. And um, for, your, for your information, we already um, have an approved um, DOSD-funded research for um, developing culture technology for Asparagopsis taxiformis. And this is um, led by Dr. Wilfred Santianes of UP Marine Science Institute. And I'm one, and I am the co um, collaborator um, as a counterpart in Batanga State University. All right. So another um, seaweed species, um, Halimi Halimania durvillae, which is um, have a lambda-like carrageenan, and it's very rich in phycobilin pigments, such as um, phycoerythrin and phycocyanine. And they have um, other medicinal properties, such as antimicrobial, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-tumor, and anti fouling Another red seaweeds, um, Portieria hormaniae, um, they also have a lambda-like carrageenan and also rich in phycobilin pigments such as uh, phycoerythrin and phycocyanin and has um, different medicinal properties such as antibacterial, antimicrobial, antioxidant, and anti-cancer. Another one, um, another red seaweeds that needs to be explored um, it, this is Gelagella acerosa, which is um, a high quality uh, consists of high quality agar. So it also has anti cancer property, antimicrobial, antioxidant, anti colonisterase, which promotes nerve transmission, anti fertility, which can be used for birth control, and anti coagulant. So um, I know this has been explored already, Gracilaria species, but um, with our observation in the VIP, this has not been um, explored as one of um, seaweed species to be cultivated. And um, there's a lot of um, sources for Gracilaria all over the VIP. So um, they are widely used as food for human consumption, as well as um, it has a high um, quality of agar, um, has a different property such as anti microbial, antioxidant, anti-nociceptive, um, which is a painkiller without anesthesia, anti-ulcer, anti-diarrheal, um, anti-hyperlipidemetic, which is um, um, the lip, um, it um, reduces the lipid content of the blood and also anti has an anti-inflammatory property. Um, we also found out um, sources of um, Laurentia all over VIP. And I think this could be um, explored um, as this um, species has high quality of agar as well, then antibacterial, antifungal, antioxidant, and anti-cancer. And now we go to brown seaweeds. No? So um, one example is um, sargassum, and it's all over the Verde Island Passage. And it is believed to have um, high quality fucoidan analgesic property, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant, um, neuroprotective, anti-tumor, fibrinolytic, which is a, 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 a property on the dissolution of blood clot, immunomodulator, hepatoprotective, and antiviral. And I know that um, University of San Carlos already um, started their um, culture technology development for sargassum. And now we go to greens. Um, we have um, observation of uh, different species of ulva, which is a great source of UFAS, antioxidant, anti-cancer, anti-coagulant, anti-hyperlipidemic, and antiviral. And um, um, for your information, we already um, have a approved um, DOSD-funded research for um, studying ulva, primarily focusing on green type bloom mechanism, but um, the data could be used for um, um, in the future culture, um, um, culture technology development. Then um, I think this is the last one, Kauler palentelifera. It is widely used as food for human consumption, antioxidant, antihyperlipidemic, anti-diabetic, um, and anti-hemagglutinin, which prevents red blood cells to clump together. 
So for the recommendation, succeeding assessments during summer and southwest monsoon could be um, should be conducted to obtain knowledge on the seasonality and potential proliferation of this species that can be used as possible by indicator species in the sites. Actually, we already conducted the summer um, field work. Um, unfortunately, it is only on two sites, which is in um, Marinduque and um, in um, Batangas. And uh, for with our preliminary um, um, processing of data, um, the Gelegela acerosa is still on the site that we um, surveyed, and um, there's a high biomass of Gelegela acerosa on that site, um, and particularly it is in Marinduque. Unfortunately, we, we didn't uh, we have a hard time going to the Mindoro provinces due to the strict um, um, COVID protocol due to the um, sudden surge of um, positive cases. Anyways, so um, in addition, um, knowledge on productive uh, reproductive phenology for possible source of uniagal culture and management of wild stock cultivation. So with that, I would like to acknowledge our funding agency, um, um, Department of Science Technology Central Office, because this is under um, GIA, and also our uh, mo monitoring agency, Pico Art, Philippine Council of Agriculture, Aquatic, and Natural Resources Research and Development, as well as Balik Scientist Program. Our university, Batanga State University, Marine Science Institute for the Assistance, and to our collaborating um, SUCs, uh, Mindoro State University, Marinduque State College, Occidental Mindoro State College, um, and Roblon State University, as well as some of our partners, um, resorts, um, Scandi Divers in um, Occident Oriental Mindoro and Iraya um, Resorts and Hotel in um, um, Occidental Mindoro. So with that, um, thank you very much, and I'll wait for your questions regarding the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, JV. So we are well on time. Uh, we already have a question for JV, but we will ask that after the third speaker during our 10 minutes uh, question and answer break before we proceed to our second set of speakers. So I'll now ask uh, Gas to introduce our third speaker. Thank you, Thank Mikey. You. Yes. Thank you, Mikey. So I would like to introduce Dr. Rachel Ravago Watamko. She's an associate professor at the Marine Science Institute at the University of the Philippines in Bidlaman and heads the Marine Molecular Ecology and Evolution Laboratory. She received a doctorate in marine science and an MSc in molecular biology and biotechnology from the same university. So just briefly on her. She applies a background in molecular biology, biotechnology, and marine science to advance research on biological diversity, ecology, and evolution in the sea. She was recognized a, as an outstanding young scientist by the NAST for her contributions to the field of molecular ecology. And wonderfully, her work is supported by quite a number of research grants from international and national funding agency, agencies. And obviously she works very closely with her graduate students on, on a variety of marine organisms. And her group primarily, primarily uses genomic data, phylogeography and population genomic approaches. So her talk is titled, Harnessing Genomics Enabled Approaches to Supportive Improved Fisheries Management and Aquaculture of Sandfish, Holothuria scabra. So I, Present Dr. Gotanko. Hello, good morning. So, thank you for the opportunity to present and share our work. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Doranilla. So, I'll be for the next 15 minutes, I'll be talking about um, sea cucumbers from um, two aspects um, aquaculture and um, fisheries management, uh, with a focus on how genomics can help improve um, on those aspects. So sea cucumbers are um, soft-bodied um, echinoderms, and they are widely distributed in a variety of benthic uh, habitats. So they are, they are found from the tropics to the temperate regions, from the shallow to, um, uh, to um, 
deep areas in the ocean. In the Philippines, uh, at least 100 species are reported to um, occur. So that might be an underestimate, probably. Um, and 40 species are reported to have um, commercial value. So they, they occur in a variety of forms and um, colors. Apart from their um, ecological importance as um, bioturbators and agents of nutrient cycling, um, we are more familiar actually with sea cucumbers because they're a high value commodity. Uh, most of you might be more familiar with sea cucumbers in the dried form. So in the photo on the right, those are actually dried um, sea cucumbers sold in, um, uh, in markets, typically for um, Asian markets. So they're known as beche de mer or uh, trepang. Um, but most of the um, uh, commodity is actually sourced from capture production. And the problem with um, capture production is that uh, the last two decades have actually seen a decline in capture production. So because these animals are very easy to access, no? so, um, they're easy to capture, um, they can't really escape. Um, so it's very easy to overexploit them. And um, the last, I think the last decades have seen really uh, reports of declining capture production. Um, and the fishery is actually characterized as being uh, overall depleted with local extirpation in some areas throughout its distribution in the Indo-West Pacific. And um, Purcell and co-workers as early as 2013 noted that its sea cucumbers are actually serially overexploited. So but the focus of this talk is just one species. So it's Holothurius cabra. It's known as the sandfish, primarily probably because it looks like, uh, um, looks like sand. Um, it's one of the high value species uh, targets for the dried product, Dutch de Mer. So high quality um, dried form can fetch as high as 300 to 700 US dollars per kilogram. That's for a typical length of um, 10, centimeter, 10 centimeter long um, after drying. Um, one of the advantages also of working with a sandfish is that it's the only, in its, uh, the only tropical species with existing culture technology for um, mass production. So pioneering work by um, Dr. Huynh Manez um, of uh, MSI, together with her co-workers, um, they have been able to adopt and um, continuously refine and develop additional methods for um, rearing these animals um, in different um, re rearing systems and grow out systems and integrating those different culture systems to scale up production. And this opens up an interesting prospect for using aquaculture not just to supplement, um, pr primarily also to supplement production, but also um, as a tool for fisheries management. So how does genomics figure in, um, in this whole thing? Um, so in this slide, I show, uh, I guess, our framework um, when we started this study several years ago um, of how we approached the um, different initiatives for improving sandfish aquaculture and fisheries management, um, a two-pronged approach from aquaculture and capture fisheries. So genomic approaches can be used to improve aquaculture through broodstock selection and um, broodstock enhancement with the goal of increasing culture production and hopefully developing um, a more premium grade um, sandfish. And for um, the aspect of capture fisheries, um, Genomic um, methods can be complementary to traditional resource assessment methods, uh, specifically for delineating genetic stocks. And these are the initiatives that I will be talking about um, in the next few minutes. So moving on to aquaculture first. No? So sandfish aquaculture literally targeting um, growth. So we recognize that obviously growth variability is um, uh, very common. In this photo, this slide, um, we illustrate um, how much um, variation exists in the early juvenile stages. So um, in the photo at the bottom, so those are um, 
uh, sandfish, 35 days post fertilization. So uh, the smallest ones are just one millimeter in length. Um, the largest ones can reach three to four. So that's more than double uh, the size difference. Um, and at this point, they've been grown exclusively in concrete tanks in the Bolinao Marine Lab. After that, uh, when they reach that size, they can now um, be sent to the ocean nursery. And um, the photo on the top is um, animals after around 70 days of rearing in um, the ocean nursery. So at this point, they're already, I think, um, around uh, 30, well, three to four centimeters uh, long. So what we want to do, obviously, is um, uh, we recognize that fast growth is a desirable production trait. And um, selecting animals for faster growth is expected to produce re reduce um, uh, growing cycles no? and increase productivity. So that's the general idea. And omics approaches can actually help um, in that aspect um, by providing the tools uh, to allow us to search for genes um, and um, gene, uh, regulatory regions that are likely associated with faster growing animals. Um, obviously growth is a very complex trait and, we, and, it's, uh, and there are different um, factors you know, that feed into growth variability. Primarily we have um, the environment, culture practices, um, uh, interactions between the animals, but what we want to focus on are the host uh, factors, specifically the genetic differences at the level of the hologenome. So the animal itself, as well as its associated um, microbiome. Um, uh, one of our uh, studies have actually already looked at growth variation in early juveniles from the view of the transcriptome. So the um, gene expression in the transcripts. So um, what we did here was we took the um, fast growing and slow growing animals um, from different hatcheries. So we sampled um, two hatcheries in uh, one hatchery in Luzon, that's Bolinao, another in Palawan, and then a third in Mindanao because we wanted to capture the geographic variation. Um, and then we did RNA sequencing and did transcriptome assembly and differential gene expression um, analysis. So in the um, plots on the right, these actually show uh, representations of the gene expression analysis. So across all three hatcheries, we see differences in the upregulated and um, downregulated um, genes. Um, panel B is a heat map representation of the same um, uh, differential expression analysis. And panel C is a principal component analysis of the glo global expression profiles. And we obviously clearly see that the fast and the slow growing animals are um, uh, separate well in a multidimensional space. So what we wanted to do obviously next is um, ask, uh, answer the question, so what are these genes that are involved in um, these, that, that, that are differentially expressed? So to make sure that um, we're not sampling artifacts of the different um, uh, rearing environments because these were from different hatcheries grown at different times, we just extracted the set of um, differentially expressed unigenes that occur in all three. And we were lucky to get uh, 66 key DEUs, which were shared across hatchery data sets and doing functional annotation and querying those against um, gene ontology, KEG uh, um, databases, and other protein databases. We recover 30 hits, you know, um, and which allow us to, um, to some extent, do some functional annotation and um, speculate as to which genes are involved in the response. And interestingly, we see. Um, genes linked to immune response, um, carbohydrate binding, um, uh, remodeling um, of the extracellular matrix, um, metabolism of biomolecules, as well as retinol, as well as transport of metabolites and fatty acid um, metabolism. So these are initial, I guess, candidates to look to that we will look at for further studies. We're also generating additional genomic resources in the form of, a, I would say, a very, very draft linkage map. Um, but uh, moving um, 
uh, towards this is actually uh, generating a key resource that will allow us to map quantitative trait loci in future studies. A third application for aquaculture is actually traceability to hatchery of origin. So we took the sequences from the transcripts and um, just um, check to see if there are any diagnostic SNPs that can allow us to identify whether um, these came from either the Bolinao, the Coron, or the Gensan hatchery. And we're also um, uh, fortunate to be able to recover 144 SNPs, which were genotyped and were apparently diagnostic. But at this point, at the well, plot on the left, it's really generated using uh, mass spec sequenome um, uh, approaches which will definitely be, be in, uh, inaccessible to regular labs or even um, other agencies who want to do traceability studies. So um, we took it a step further and developed a rapid um, simple assay that just uses PCR and electrophoresis. So that's for aquaculture. So for natural populations, we actually use um, population genetic approaches to do stock delineation. And um, Earlier studies, um, two years ago, um, so we published a paper that showed um, that using microsatellite markers, we demonstrate that there's um, regional genetic structure across uh, Philippine populations. And that structure actually nicely aligns with the different biogeographic regions. So we see here a plot of the Philippines and then the um, points there are the locations we sampled and the colors correspond to the different genetic population. So if they're the same color, they belong to the same population. So we recovered six distinct populations. Um, these kinds of studies allow us to look at genetic diversity um, and to map out spatial patterns of genetic structure and connectivity. The practical application is to identify management units and to define the spatial boundaries of genetic stocks which can guide restocking, stock enhancement, and translocation protocols, um, especially in, um, when we're using them in conjunction with aquaculture-produced animals. So we just took um, population genetics a notch higher and moved it to um, population genomics because we wanted to capitalize on the use of higher resolving um, power of SNPs um, to examine genetic structure at smaller spatial scales. And the idea behind um, the sampling scheme actually is it is really anchored on the um, existing hatcheries, which have a capability for small to medium scale production of Holothurius cabra in anticipation that they may be able to serve as production clusters for the juveniles for um, eventually restocking or um, transplantation in the future. So, um, Quickly, what did we find when we did the population genomics uh, across these different biogeographic regions? Um, the SNP markers reveal genetic structure that was not detected by the microsatellite. So that is fairly expected. Um, and that is actually what we really want, no? to capitalize on that higher resolving power. So at the scale on the left, on the green panel, we see populations along the Western Luzon coast in Palawan. Um, we see that all five populations are very different. Each one is very different. Um, and that covers a scale of 800 kilometers. Um, across the scale of um, zooming in to the, um, the, the uh, Western Luzon population, a scale of 600, 700 kilometers, we see um, three different genetic groups. Um, for, Min for the Visayas region, the one in the orange panel, we see only the G1 population, Eastern Samar, as being very different from the rest of the Visayas population. So the, or the pink dots there in the vicinity of Sifdek, that's, uh, and the one in Mindoro, they appear to be a single population, even with the SNPs. And interestingly, at very small spatial scales in the Davao Gulf, we see um, significant differentiation of um, populations in the Davao Gulf, as well as the population near the proximity of um, the General Santos hatchery. So to summarize um, quickly, you know, so genomics actually opens up a lot of opportunities you know, for applications for aquaculture, specifically for broodstock selection and enhancement by identifying um, the mechanisms involved in growth regulation 
uh, generating genomic resources to, uh, that will be useful for future marker-assisted selection like linkage mapping and also developing markers for traceability to hatcheries. But this um, uh, work still has a very long way to go because we need more genomic resources for um, further work and more detailed mapping of um, variants and markers for growth performance. So for fisheries management, um, genomics has been very useful in the delineation of um, genetic stocks and estimating genetic diversity and effective population sizes to support spatially explicit management in for interventions such as prioritizing, prioritizing areas for protection, um, designs for stock enhancement and translocation protocols, specifically those including the use of hatchery produced animals in the future. So with that, um, that ends my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, to our first set of speakers. Maybe we could already start the uh, Q and A. And uh, we have the first questions. First question on the chat box is uh, actually addressed to Dr. Sako. And uh, I think I have a related question. So I might just as well uh, connect these two questions from, from myself and from certain Lowell Ipora. So uh, Mr. Ipora, uh, mention about those three uh, two green ones. So, so those two two green ones. So it, it basically uh, relates to uh, the the name of of that species. No, if 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 it does uh, create or cause some uh, macroalgal blooms, but related to those species, maybe because they are basically uh, morphologically simple, but they could be phenotypically plastic. The, uh, does your project aim to uh, uh, molecularly classify them? Is it really ulva intestinalis or is it really chitomorpha, uh, uh, whatever species is now? Uh, it, uh, you used to know it as chitomorpha crassa. You know? So yeah, maybe if you could connect those two questions in terms of the identity of those two species and does it create uh, uh, macroalgal uh, blooms in the area? Thank you. Okay, so thank you for that question. No? So, um, yung first question is, um, part of the project will be identifying molecular phylogeny of um, this collected seaweed species, specifically yung green seaweeds. Um, that's why um, um, ang, ka ang ka collaborate ko with this um, certain project, which is ULVA project, is Dr. Wilfred Santianes, and he'll be the counterpart on doing the molecular phylogeny studies. So far, um, because of the um, uncertainties of um, COVID and um, surges of cases, um, our fieldwork were, were postponed and was not able to uh, collect um, samples and um, assess the area. Um, with the second question is uh, if there is a um, bloom of that um, seaweed species. No? With our observation yet, there is no bloom forming yet um, of that species, but it uh, could be a good um, baseline information if we could able to provide uh, a possible um, occurrences on different sampling period like summer, um, southwest monsoon and northeast monsoon because it could be a, a, a baseline information that we could tell if um, this species is a bloom species, uh, forming species in the area. But um, the component of the project, of the ULVA project, will be conducted on the different coastal areas in Matangas, primarily those near um, resort and um, coastal um, population. Those are the strategic sites that we will be um, sampling and assess for the for this ulva species. And actually, we already started uh, doing it um, near um, Batangas City, which is near uh, near the international um, port in Batangas City. And this is conducted by some of my students. They are already started doing um, baseline information on in that area. And we will uh, try to monitor if um, the proliferation is uh, within a year or uh, could extend into uh, uh, the, the following year. So that's it. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, JV. Uh, just a time check. We have about eight minutes to uh, have this Q&A uh, portion before we proceed to our second set. Maybe Gus, you could ask the next question. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So uh, I would like to ask Dr. Reyes uh, a question on uh, parthenogenesis. Uh, do, do you think uh, an increase in parthenogenesis actually increases the damage of the strips to the bananas? Uh, thank you for that question. Yes, it will increase the damage to banana because uh, based on our uh, study in the life history of trips uh, reared on Saba banana under laboratory condition, 80% uh, of the eggs that were laid by the virgin female gave rise to female individuals and only 20% uh, were male. So it means that all of this will lay eggs and when they lay eggs, they will insert that again in the plant tissue, thus injuring the, you know, damaging the, the, the flower or the fruit. So it's the feeding, actually the culprit here are the female trips. And uh, another one is the life cycle. How, you know, the life cycle, they have a longer life cycle. I mean, li not life cycle, uh, lifespan. Uh, longer than males. So they will produce eggs for several days and they will feed for so many days, much longer than the male ones. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I, I have a question too, uh, not unless no, no, Gus, no. you want to say something? No, no, that's okay. Okay, uh, I have a question to uh, Rachel. Uh, now I'm trying to dip my feet into population genetics no? and I'm trying to understand maybe uh, regarding the uh, different population that you observe in your sandfish. How, how do you think, is it a structured or in terms of gene flow or how does this species get this wide distribution and then uh, they seem to be uh, uh, belong to a specific population or, yeah. Thank you for the question, Mikey. No. So um, in our study, so we looked at different scales. So at the broadest spatial scale, which is across the Philippine archipelago, um, uh, we see that the populations actually, and they align with um, the biogeographic regions. So, and that is, sort of expected given um, what we know about the dispersal potential of the animal. No? So it's fairly limited because it's benthic. So um, once the larvae uh, settle um, uh, to uh, the benthic habitat, they don't really move anymore much. No? So we expect some level of um, structuring. But when, when we looked at um, within biogeographic regions, which is really the target when you want to do some um, demographic connectivity or fisheries um, management. Uh, we, it's also important to look at those scales um, uh, because that's the scale really of um, like translocations or uh, stock restoration efforts, right? Um, we see that there is still some uh, genet genetic differentiation. So there is still some limited dispersal, even at scales um, around 100, uh, 100 to 200 kilometer um, different, uh, distance, there's still limited dispersal among those populations. And um, it could also be important to context contextualize. No? Um, it also differ differs on the region. So mm -hmm. because um, we have to figure in habitat complexity, the oceanographic circulation, and, and other factors. So it's really uh, um, important. Uh, to do a, an initial survey um, in the in the sites that you're planning to work in. Yeah, uh, thank you that you mentioned about the oceanographic thing, no? Because yeah, that was supposed to be my follow-up question, but thank you for mentioning that already. But is the uh, I don't know if when the gametes or when whatever is released in the water column, uh, is it important how long they stay in the water column before they settle and that they get transported? Yes, so it's actually um, important because that's one predictor of uh, dispersal potential. So 
the longer that they stay in the water column, the longer that their that the life history stage is pelagic. Obviously, the farther away that 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 they can potentially get. So I say potentially because there are other factors like um, intrinsic um, life history or even um, interactions with um, you know, oceanographic circulation factors or other small small scale circulation um, that will uh, um, uh, further um, restrict the dispersal potential. So they can reach um, uh, further distances if the pelagic life history is uh, longer than shorter, but that's not always necessarily the case. Because you can overlay many other factors of the marine environment to restrict that dispersal. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Unless there's some other question, maybe Gus, you have other questions or the other participants? Yeah. I haven't seen any in the, the, the YouTube link, if there's any questions in there, just, no, nothing there. But actually, can I just ask uh, Rachel uh, just a, an interest question? How big do these uh, uh, trepang get? Because I've seen the ones in Northern Australia, the, the ones that are very popular, are very big. This one just... Yeah. So I think the um, uh, they get as big as um, I think one point eight. I think the, if I remember correctly, uh, one and a half um, kilos, and um, maybe for uh, probably 30, 30 cm. So they can reach um, fairly, but that's a, a long time. But market size. Um, in terms of the aquaculture, um, the, the cycle, if they rear it for, um, I think, um, 12 months, you know, the maximum is uh, 18 months. So that's, uh, that's a long time. So that's uh, to reach um, market size of um, uh, 20, at least 20 cm. But when, they get, but when they're dried, so it shrinks to 10% of the original size. So. <laughs> I see it. Thank you. Okay, I, I think uh, we are ready to proceed to our uh, second set of speakers. But before uh, before we proceed, I think uh, uh, we could still uh, ask question to our first three speakers uh, uh, later. No, we we could have an open forum uh, uh, at the end of our uh, presentation. But maybe just very briefly, I have a brief question to JB. No, because. Uh, VIP is supposed to be the biodiversity center of biodiversity, but you only presented a few seaweed species. Uh, is this just a tip of the iceberg or is it everything that you uh, have seen? It's only the tip of the iceberg, Mike. Okay. <laughs> um, <you>. Yes, <laughs> but we will okay. be, um, we hope we could be able to um, publish our submitted manuscript and we will be um, sort of initially present the initial findings from our Northeast Monsoon sampling for the Seaweed Seagrass Assessment. Okay, thank you, JB. Thank okay, you, Okay, so we'll, we'll proceed to the second set of speakers. The first speaker will be introduced by Gas. Go ahead, Gas. Yes, thank uh, you. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Maria Junami Lebata Ramos. So she's a scientist with, I, I like this, with an organization called ISDA which stands for Integrated Services for the Development of Aquaculture and Fisheries, which is based in the Southeast Asian Fisheries Development Center. And she's in the Aquacultural Department of CIF, which, which is CIFDEC in Tigbawan, Iloilo. She obtained her Master's in Science in Fisheries Biology at the Institute of Marine Fisheries and Oceano Oceanology at the College of Fisheries UP Visayas in Yagao, Iloilo. And she then did her doctorate in ocean sciences in the School of Ocean Sciences at the University of Wales in Bangor, Anglesey, Wales in the UK. Her research interests include the culture of crustaceans like the Scylla species and pinnades, mollusks like abalone, oysters, giant clams, angel wing clams, and imbau. She has an interest in assessment and rehabilitation of mangroves, Integrated Multitrophic Aquaculture, Environmental Impacts of Aquaculture. And her present work is on feeding trials on abalone grow out culture. So the title of her talk is, okay, excuse me, I, I lost it on, on my 
piece of paper. So, I, I so the title of uh, Junimi's talk is The Growth and Survival of Oyster Species Chrysotrea iridale. Excuse me if I make a mistake in pronouncing that. And she's made a comparison of wild and hatchery bred spat in grow out culture. So, thank you very much, Junimi. Uh, you, you, you're muted at the moment. So could you please unmute yourself? <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. It. Thank you, Dr. Duranila, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like first. I would like to thank uh, the OSTP card for funding the study, and of course, my CIFDIC AQD team for making field work uh, less tedious and more fun, and Dr. Wing Igiya for introducing me to this uh, meeting and encouraging me to present. And of course, uh, Paase for um, the opportunity to present the results of our work. So we compared growth and survival of the oysters across Austria Iridale using wild and hatchery bred spat in grow out culture. So this is this was one of the three experiments that we did under the National Oyster R&D program funded by uh, the OSTP card. So oysters are being harvested and cultured for their flesh and shell. And the flesh may be eaten raw. Um, prepared into several or different dishes or processed into different products. And the shells, especially here locally, they are used as uh, settlement substrates for competent uh, larvae to produce the next generation of oysters. And these two are being processed into different products because of their high calcium carbonate content. So this oyster, the Crossostria iridale, is one of the four um, commercially important species of oysters here in the Philippines. And it is the most popular and the most sought after uh, species because they can grow to as large as uh, 15 centimeters in shell length. However, the increasing demand for this oyster species coupled with the decreasing uh, spatfall has caused unstable production. So to address this under the national R&D program, the hatchery technology for this species was uh, developed and refined. Traditionally, um, oysters are produced by um, providing settlement substrates in oyster beds and allow the larvae to settle and uh, months later, like 10 to 12 months, uh, these oysters uh, form uh, like this oyster reef, especially when uh, recycled motorbike tires are used. So this is the most common substrate in this, our study site. So oysters uh, grown traditionally uh, are clustered and of different sizes. So usually they are mm, manually separated and the larger ones are the ones sold in uh, high-end markets. So it's a very uh, laborious process. So as part of our project under the OST, we were tasked to develop technology to improve uh, production of oysters in grow out culture. So we designed uh, two new methods and compared this with the traditional methods. And with that, we were able to uh, develop this uh, method using uh, pouches. So using pouches, we were able to produce oysters individually and almost of the same size, uh, like the one shown in this tray. Uh, these were the contents of one pouch with uh, 25 pockets. So we were able to publish the paper at Aquaculture Research just recently. So these very same pouch were used in this study comparing growth and survival of the wild and hatchery bred spot uh, in grow out culture. So our study was done in Batan Bay. So Batan Bay is here in the northern part of uh, Panay Island. And Batan Bay is part of Aklan province. And it is the most uh, 
important source of oysters in the province and uh, their main market is Manila. For the wild spat, we collected them using this um, pet bottles. We cut the ends of the pet bottles to make them into open cylinders, roughened the surfaces with uh, sandpaper and deployed them in sets of six cylinders. So these, these were the spats that settled on the surface of these pet bottles, which we harvested later. For the hatchery bred uh, oysters, we collected um, oyster brood stock from the study site. And then we brought them to the CIFDEC AQD hatchery in Tigbawan, Iloilo, marked here on the map as number one. And then after spawning, when they reached the size of five millimeter shell length, they were transferred to the Dumangas Brackish Water Station of uh, CIFDEC AQD as their nursery site. So it's marked here as uh, number two on the map. And when they're ready for grow out culture, they were transported to, to Batan Bay. So on the 10th of May, 2016, um, oysters were induced to spawn in the hatchery. And at the same time, the pet bottles were deployed in the study site. And three months later, the spat were transported from the Brackish Water Station to Aklan for the commencement of the grow out culture. And at the same time, the spat were harvested from the, the pet bottle coaches. And a total of 1,450 spat were produced from the main spawnings. So we matched this with the same number of uh, wild spat collected from the bay. Regardless of uh, sort, I, even if the age were, was almost the same, the mean shell length of wild spat and the mean body weight were larger as compared with those produced from the hatchery. You can see the, the wide difference. So all these spat were measured individually for shell length and body weight uh, prior to stocking them. And they were uh, stocked in these pouches, so 25 pieces per, per pouch. And so we utilized like uh, 58 pouches for each of the hatchery and uh, wild spat oysters. And then they were brought to the study site and uh, randomly suspended from the rafts that were earlier prepared. So you can see this uh, hanging already submerged in water, the hanging pouches on the first draft. And we continued to, to hang the, the rest of the pouches on the second draft. So for the monthly sampling, we measured 20% of the stocks for shell length and body weight. So that's um, five uh, pieces of oyster oysters per pouch. And during harvest, we measured all the oysters for shell length and body weight. 5% of the total harvest were analyzed for proximate composition at the laboratory facilities of aquaculture technology at CIFTEC AQD, and 15% were analyzed for meat shield. So we weighed um, individual oysters, shocked them, uh, removed blood to dry, and then weighed them to the nearest tenth of a gram. So this was the formula that we used to to obtain the meat shield and uh, these were obtained from these uh, references. For the environmental variables, uh, we measured temperature and salinity daily in the study site using um, thermometer and reflectometer. And monthly during the sampling of stocks, we measured DO, pH, sulfide, phosphate, nitrite, nitrate and ammonia using YSI multi-parameter meter and the HAC spectrophotometer respectively. So all measurements were taken at three points in the study site to represent three replicates. And these were reported as means plus standard error of the mean. So hatchery bread and wild uh, oysters were compared in terms of growth rates, survival, meat chilled proximate composition using two sample t-tests at um, 
p equal to less than five, uh, 0.05 uh, statistical significance, and the growth rate in terms of length and weight were correlated with the different individual parameters using Pearson correlation. So all this and th this test and the, the graphs were done using um, Minitab 17.0. So for the results, uh, these are the mean shell lengths and uh, body weights of oysters from the commencement of the uh, experiment during the monthly samplings and at harvest. So the wild oysters are represented with uh, white circles and the hatchery bred oysters uh, are represented with uh, black circles. So despite the differences in initial size, both oysters showed increasing trends throughout the culture period. And they showed almost parallel lines, both in shell length and in body weight. In terms of the monthly growth rate, uh, there was no significance in growth rate in both length and weight, except for the first month of culture, wherein wild oysters showed a significantly higher growth rate in terms of weight, as represented here by the white squares for the wild oysters and black squares for the hatchery bred oysters. While um, hatchery bred oysters were significantly higher in terms of length compared with the wild oysters. All throughout the sampling period, there, there were no significant differences between the growth rates of the two oysters. Survival also showed no significant difference from the, the first month uh, sampling until harvest. And we harvested oysters at around 90% for both uh, wild and hatchery bred oysters. The meat shield of uh, both oysters were almost the same, with the wild oysters having 16.4% uh, uh, meat shield and the hatchery bred oysters with around 15.6%. Uh, For the proximate composition, the proximate composition of both hatchery bred and wild oysters were almost the same. And the figures did not differ for ash, crude protein, crude fat, and nitrogen uh, free extract with the crude fiber very negligible. So, so both the proximate composition of these oysters did not differ. Uh, temperature showed a decreasing trend from um, the commencement of uh, the culture period through, throughout the burr months until uh, mid-February, and then it started to increase until the oysters were harvested in April. For the salinity, we can see um, fluctuating salinity, and most of these uh, drops in salinity were caused by uh, heavy rains or flooding in the bay. Since we correlated growth rates with environmental parameters, uh, growth rates were only positively correlated with salinity. So there was a positive correlation of uh, growth rates in terms of uh, shell length, both for the wild and hatchery bred oysters with salinity. There was no correlation with any of the uh, environmental parameters uh, measured. So this may be explained by the increasing calcium carbonate in the water with the increasing salinity. For the other uh, monthly parameters, all the measurements were within the acceptable levels for the uh, marine or estuarine uh, habitat, except for these ones in uh, red figures, wherein for DO, the, the minimum uh, acceptable level is 5 ppm. And we can see that in most samplings, we had um, very low DO. And for phosphate, the maximum acceptable level is at 0.2 ppm. And on three occasions, um, we had uh, higher levels of uh, phosphate. However, these were done only monthly and we, did, we didn't know uh, how often oysters are exposed to levels outside the, the normal range. 
So in conclusion, wild and uh, hatchery bred oysters did not significantly differ in growth rates, survival, meat yield, and proximate composition. So with this, we can uh, infer that hatchery bred spot of oysters, especially the Crossostria iridale, are as comparable as their wild uh, conspecifics, and they may be recommended for use in culture areas with limited supplies of uh, wild stocks. So I think this is my last slide. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Junami. I think we pass on to the next two speakers. Who Thank you very much. Like yeah, I'll, we'll proceed with our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Barria Rodriguez, uh, who is an assistant professor at the UP Marine Science Institute, a colleague of mine. So she obtained her PhD in marine and environmental science at the University of Ryukus, Okinawa, Japan. So her field of research are coral reef ecology, invertebrate biology, uh, propagation, coral reef restoration, and conservation and management. So she studied coral reproduction and became one of the pioneers who established uh, reproductive timing of multiple uh, coral species in Northwestern Philippines and applied this to uh, coral larval culture for reef restoration. So this work served as a baseline for succeeding coral reproduction studies in the country. So currently she is leading uh, several international uh, funded projects on coral restoration science using larval, larval seeding technology and socio-political governance. So in addition, she is also the principal investigator of various national funded projects on coral reef uh, benthic diversity, as well as researches on coral population dynamics, physiology and reproduction that is exposed to different uh, environmental stress factors, overfishing, and she hoped that her research output will serve as basis for science-based policies for sound management and conservation. So uh, Van, as she is fondly called, will present her uh, research on the F2 generation produced from 12 years old sexually propagated massive coral uh, colonies. So this is a, a, a study that has been ongoing for the last uh, 12, 13 years. Go ahead, Van, thank you. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to share our long-running research this morning. As mentioned by Mikey, I am Van, and I will be presenting our study on behalf of my co-authors, uh, Dr. Dexter De La Cruz, Katia Bonilla, Charlon Ligson, Dr. Tai Chong To. Dr. Al Edwards, Dr. Peter Harrison, and Dr. James Guest. Uh, this study is the first to document uh, the first F2 generated corals from 12 year old sexually propagated massive corals, Favitis abdita and Favitis comani. It is well known that coral reefs around the world are degrading and coral cover declines primarily due to global warming, a global climate change impacts such as ocean warming, <clears throat> ocean acidification, and sea level rise. In addition, threats such as illegal and destructive fishing practices, eutrophication or nutrient enrichment and sediment sedimentation affect coral reefs at local scale. Unfortunately, study shows that some coral, uh, some reefs are unable to recover due to prevailing multiple threats. And in order to assist coral reef recovery, active coral restoration techniques are employed uh, in degraded reef areas. Okay, so there are two active coral restoration techniques that are currently uh, are available in restoration. First is the asexual technique using coral fragments, and the second one is the sexual mode of propagation using coral gametes or larvae. 
these are the following list of the advantages and disadvantages of both techniques. And in asexual technique, uh, the main drawback is the collateral damage to donor colonies, but there is an immediate increase in coral cover. However, for sexual technique, propagules are genotypically distinct. And this is very important to avoid a massive die-off of colonies. In terms of cost, uh, it was noted previously that asexual technique is less costly than its sexual counterpart. And uh, this result um, inspired us to investigate further whether this uh, notion of the cost is true or not for long-term studies. Okay, so uh, our study evaluated and compared the cost effectiveness of both techniques using Acropora granulosa for more than one year. Corals were, were reared sexually and asexually from the outdoor hatchery, sorry, was that from the outdoor hatchery facility, ocean nursery, and outplanted on the reef. Our results showed that sexual, uh, pro sexually produced corals have faster growth rate and higher survival, both uh, from the ocean nursery and degraded reefs. When cost was computed, that is mainly based on materials, supplies, boat trips, and manpower, it turned out that sexual propagules are cheaper than its asexual counterpart. Overall, uh, sexual propagules are more than four times cheaper than fragments after more than one year of monitoring and are therefore more cost-effective. Okay, considering that um, sexual propagation is more cost-effective and then it's asexual counterpart, it is imperative to take advantage of our knowledge on coral reproduction to be able to maximize uh, coral restoration success. In Northwestern Philippines, we found that majority of sclerotinian corals spawn in the warm months, so around March to um, that around March to June. Uh, the video that you are seeing is a coral spawning and it releases gametes in the water column. This will be followed by fertilization until it becomes a competent larvae that is capable of settling on hard substrates on the leaf. When coral settles, they grow until they become an adult. And uh, this species is Acropora millepora. And Acropora millepora um, is already an adult or capable of producing the meats at the age of three. Okay, when propagating corals uh, using the meats, there are two methods. The first method is through direct, um, direct larval seeding of coral larvae on degraded reef substrates. And second is the two-step transplantation approach wherein the coral larvae are collected, introduced to artificial settlement substrates and reared in, in the hatchery or ocean nursery uh, before transplanting on the reef. Okay. Most of the studies on sexual propagation utilized fast growing and less tolerant species. These species are a few examples, Acropora granulosa, Acropora millepora, Acrop and Acropora tenuis. All of these studies were done in Northwestern Philippines. Majority of these studies using multiple Acropora species were conducted in less than or to a maximum of five years, meaning it's still a short term for a coral restoration study. Thus, uh, for many studies, it's really advantageous for projects to use fast growing species uh, with high turnover uh, rate and um, research outcome. So to date, there is limited study on uh, massive corals or stress-tolerant species, primarily because of its slow-growing nature. In May 2009, uh, we did the experiment on massive corals. So gravid parent colonies were collected, generating F1 parents, which were outplanted in 2011. And in the Excito nursery or hatchery, you will see coral juveniles on artificial substrates, Favitis abdita on top, and Favitis colmani at the bottom. These were transferred to ocean nursery after 18 months and outplanted on the reefs after uh, four months. And we continuously monitored it until to the present. 
Okay, so we found that after five years, Favitis colmani is already sexually mature. Uh, on the right uh, photo, you will see three arrows that are pointing to pink uh, eggs. So these are already uh, gravid, meaning they are about to spawn in maybe less than a month. Okay, however, for Favitis abdita, that we, we found that their uh, sexual maturity is at six years old. So um, also these are the coral gametes that are um, already, that are ready to, spot, to be spawned in less than a month. Okay, moving forward this year, 2021, um, these are the photos, representative photos of F1 generated colonies of Vitis abdita and uh, for Vitis colmani, for Vitis colmani to your right. And we uh, checked for their um, eggs and we found that almost 90% of the outplanted colonies on the reef were already sexually mature. Please note, however, that for these species, the size ranges really is uh, diverse or variable. For example, for colony diameter of Vitis abdita, it ranges from three centimeter to 31.6 centimeters. So this is already 12 year old. And for uh, Favitis colmani, 3.5 to 21 uh, centimeters. So it's, um, we took advantage uh, that we have this F1 colony to be able to produce F2 colony. And also these are important to use to be able to minimize impacts on coral has harvesting for uh, reef restoration. Okay, so this study is the first uh, attempt to generate F2 generation of massive coral species uh, of favitis. And uh, we did some exploratory experiment uh, to perform multiple crosses of favitis abdita, F1 and wild colonies and determine the differences in fertilization success, settlement success, and post-settlement survival for each cross combination. Okay, so this is uh, Northwestern Philippines. This is our study site. Uh, this is Bolinao Marine Laboratory. There are three sites that we are continuously monitoring, Lucero Marine Protected Area, uh, somewhere in Anda, Marcos Sandbar, and uh, Kanyogan. Okay, so what you're seeing, these are on the right are my, our culture tanks, our holding tanks. So when we collected coral colonies, we put them first on holding tanks, and then uh, we wait for these corals to spawn at night. Okay, so... To collect coral gametes from F1 generated corals, few colonies of both for both species were collected from source reefs, and these colonies were transported to the hatchery, and then until coral spawning. So fertilization and settlement exper experiment follows, um, and were introduced to artificial substrates to for F2 coral production. On the left photo. Uh, is a photo with my co-authors on the boat with coral colonies. The middle photo shows our holding tanks. And on the right, um, this is a picture of our raceway uh, with conditioned artificial substrates. Okay, so fertilization and experiment was done for only for Favitis abdita using multiple crosses um, F1 wild colonies and its combination. And for both species, uh, we use them to produce F2 propagules for future grow out on the leaf. And so this figure shows uh, the percent fertilization of Avaitis abdita among cross combinations. On the X axis are the cross combinations. And you will see that um, in blue bars, two hours post fertilization, uh, fertilization rate differs across uh, combination. However, after four hours, fertilization was similar and it even reached to almost 100% for all cross combinations. So this uh, figure shows a representative uh, photo of the development of coral larvae, the embryonic development of coral larvae. And um, the figure shows different 
uh, embryonic stages at various multiple crosses from two hour post fertilization to 15 hour post fertilization. And you will notice that for three uh, treatments, for example, if you look at two hour post fertilization, the stage of the embryo is similar. And that is also similar until 15 hour post fertilization. Okay, so this is the result of uh, settlement of Vitis Abdita across um, combinations. And you will notice that there is an increasing trend from F1 by F1, from F1 by wild and wild by wild. But if you will notice that the standard deviation is really big. So when we employed statistical analysis, uh, it shows that there's no significant difference in terms of uh, larval settlement. These two photos are representative uh, pictures of uh, corals just settled and initially calcified. Here at, at the bottom picture, you will notice that there are six tentacles. So it's really cool. It's cute. And you will see that they're already starting to calcify this um, white uh, coral here. Okay, so this study is by far the first to demonstrate long-term sexual propagation of massive corals so for 12 years. And we will be continually monitoring um, these corals, hopefully to be able to produce uh, multiple generations. And uh, really for the highlight of this study is that we have generated F2 generation of larvae and coral juveniles and for both species, Favitis adita and Favitis fulmani. And we really hope that they will survive. Now they are still in the hatchery and we will put them out probably early next year. And then hopefully they will grow into adults uh, and also a reproductive one. Okay, so for future direction, of course, we don't want a reef that is just full of massive corals, right? So we wanted to be able to produce multiple generations of corals with various life history strategies um, uh, to be able to, uh, to have a diverse coral cover in, uh, in reefs. So, um, and also until such time that the degraded reef areas are restored and are self-sufficient in terms of uh, coral larval supply. Since this is a long-term study, this initiative started actually in 2008, but our experiment started in 2009 with under the GEF uh, World Bank project led by Dr. the late Dr. Gomez, a coral reef targeted research and capacity building for management. And um, now we have a project with uh, Australian Center for International and Agricultural Research, and we are uh, now working on, on, on these colonies with the help of the HR project. And of course, I'd like to mention or I'd like to acknowledge UPMSI and Marine Environment and Resources Foundation for um, the admin support. That would be all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Van. That is an interesting talk. So we will expect uh, some questions later. So for our last speaker, but definitely not the least. So we have uh, uh, Dr. Iniguez. So Dr. Iniguez is an associate professor at the Marine Science Institute. So she's a colleague of mine and she heads the Biological Oceanography and Modeling of Ecosystem Lab, or shortly called Biome. So she obtained her PhD from the University of Miami in Florida with support from the Fulbright and Mayad scholarships. So she uses field, laboratory, and computer modeling approaches to investigate the interactions between environmental condition and the base of the marine food web and how this could impact Philippine fisheries, particularly the occurrence of harmful algal bloom. So she's leading a program to develop early warning systems for harmful algal blooms in the Philippines. So she's a recipient of multiple awards. So one of these is a 2012 recipient of the uh, L'Oreal UNESCO for Women in Science Fellowship and was also awarded 
as outstanding young scientist by the Philippine National Academy of Science and Technology in 2017. So without much ado, uh, please welcome Dr. Iniguez to present her talk on an early warning systems for HAVs, pathways toward operational ocean observation and forecasting. Thank you, Aleva. Thank you, Mikey, for that introduction. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, wherever you are. Uh, I will just share my screen. Okay, so is the is the um, presentation format? Is it is it what you see? Okay, thank you. Yes, so uh, I'll be essentially giving an overview of our work to develop an early warning system for harmful algal blooms or HABs that can hopefully be a pathway towards enhancing the country's capacity for operational ocean observation and forecasting to aid in mitigating the impacts of HABs and to support healthier coastal systems. So um, this is a whole slide for my co-authors on this presentation. So as you can see from the long list of authors, this program has entailed the efforts of many people from an intersection of scientific disciplines and organizations, including UP Diliman, Los Baños, Tacloban, uh, Palawan State University, different BIFAR, or Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources units, and LGUs. So I present this on behalf of everyone. So harmful algal blooms, or more commonly known as red tide, is a phenomenon where there is an increase in the number of microalgae that either harbors toxins that then accumulate through the food web and or their sheer numbers leads to the depletion of oxygen in the water column, causing the mortality of marine organisms. So recently, we came up with a long-term assessment of HAB events in the Philippines and Malaysia, representing uh, Southeast Asia, as part of the Global HAB Status Report. Through this analysis, we garnered that here in the Philippines, HAB events increased in number and duration during the early uh, during the 80s to early 2000s, but have stabilized or even decreased since then. However, what is concerning is that new sites are still cropping up and being affected by HABs, and other types of HAB species and syndromes have been observed in more recent years. In another study, our meta-analysis found that these emerging sites and impacts could be linked to increased observations due to monitoring, as well as increased aquaculture activities, in particular, regions of the world, including here you see uh, Southeast Asia. So this relationship with aquaculture could be because there is more monitoring, but also possibly be due to the eutrophication um, that can be associated with these aquaculture activities. So here, here in the Philippines, aquaculture and development activities are increasing, yet the capacity to monitor and assess the condition of coastal waters is still lacking, which can ultimately lead to increased threat from HABs and unsustainable development activities. So this endeavor was born from the ongoing DOSTP card funded program that's entitled Hazard Detection and Mitigation Tools for Algal Blooms in a Changing Marine Environment, which aims to help answer the challenges in monitoring and managing the variable and expansive HABs our country experiences by developing means for more rapid and increased scale of detection of algal blooms and developing robust early warning systems that would allow for more proactive mitigation and enhanced understanding of HABs. The framework of the HAB program is represented in this diagram. Methods and tools for the detection of HAB environmental conditions, the species and toxins are being developed. Concurrently, activities such as intensive field sampling, toxin protein analysis, will help to enhance understanding uh, of the complex patterns and factors involved in the occurrence of these blooms. 
So some of these methods and tools contribute to the formation of the informatic system for HABs. And this platform contributes to the people-centered early warning system, which involve as well the inputs and responses of the partners and stakeholders. So the early warning system that we followed is represented in this diagram and is based on the Sendai disaster risk framework for disaster risk reduction. The first component is HAB risk knowledge, which involves understanding the patterns and risks of toxic blooms and fish kills. The second component is monitoring and warning service, which involves detecting and monitoring of HAB organisms and the conditions and um, and the conditions and providing analysis, the assessments and warnings. So the third component is dissemination and communication, which involves how best to communicate and disseminate warnings and promote understanding. The last component is response capability, which involves how people respond to the warnings or even prior to the occurrence of HAB events, the, the actions that they can already take. So I'll go over key activities that we've undertaken to build up these different components in our focal areas within Pangasinan, in Samar, Leyte, Puerto Princesa, in Palawan, and in Capiz. Obtaining the HAB risk knowledge comprised of two main aspects. One is the consolidation and analysis of biophysical information related to HABs, such as the phytoplankton abundance and shellfish toxicity, and also on the ocean oceanography of the sites. So these were through contributions and collation of historical data obtained in research work and agency monitoring efforts. So the second aspect is on socioeconomic information. This was primarily done by conducting a participatory HAB risk assessment with the partner communities at Bulinao in Pangasinan, Yabong in Samar, and Sapian Bay in Capiz. So these help to understand the impacts of HABs on these communities and stakeholders, as well as derive local knowledge on uh, HABs and what the, the, those on the ground have already observed. The monitoring and warning related activities can be divided into monitoring on site or uh, the field monitoring. And the other is remote monitoring through various technologies. We had several collaborative field monitoring activities with the various program partners that also helped clarify methodological approaches and allowed for standardization with the SUC partners. So we are also exploring the potential of what's called the biotoxin adsorption tracking technique or BAT for short, as a toxin monitoring tool in lieu of the shellfish. So this setup was initially designed by Dr. Rodora Azanza and her team uh, several years ago. And this is composed of a resin that adsorbs toxin from the water column if uh, that's present there, whether from the phytoplankton or released in the water column. And this is placed inside a container surrounded by mesh and tied to a PVC frame. And for this project, we placed these bat setups in HAB hotspot areas in Puerto Princesa, Tacloban, and Maqueda Bay in Samar for uh, almost weekly sampling for over a year. And we, we are comparing the bat toxicity with the shellfish using two analytical methods, uh, HPLC and RBA or the receptor binding assay, which is the method used by the regulatory agency BIFAR. So very initial results uh, uh, indicate the potential of BAT having a toxicity, toxicity signal that's about a week before the shellfish, which we, would be good for early warning. Though, um, please take this with a grain of salt since we are actually still completing the analysis for this. One part of the remote monitoring is the use of ocean color for large assessment, large scale assessments. And the semi-automated HAB detection system or CHABs model was developed by Alduin Almo and Dr. Laura David from UPMSI. And this model obtains national scale chlorophyll A concentrations from MODIS aqua satellite images at four kilometer resolution. So this was also developed as an early warning model where it can warn of potential blooms using chlorophyll, chlorophyll A anomalies. 
It includes an important feedback system called Do You Have It, through which users can calibrate, validate, and improve the model forecast. So this is quite important um, in order to, um, to help the uh, threshold or uh, standard to, to establish the threshold of the chlorophyll A anomaly for particular areas. The second part of remote monitoring is the development of cost-effective sensors for real-time automated water properties uh, measurements. So the SensePAC, which is a low-cost sensor, was developed in collaboration with Dr. Giovanni Tapang and Ali Ariesgad of the National Institute of Physics. So the SensePAC measures temperature, salinity, pH, and dissolved oxygen, and is designed in a modular way with the battery, electronics, and communication, and sensor modules. It can be deployed on the surface, like this one that was tested in a shellfish farm in Bolinao, and will transmit data at program time intervals using long range radio frequencies to a base station receiver that is connected to the internet. And then the data is stored in a database. Then Dr. Cesar's, Cesar Villanoy and Charina Amedoropolio and Rachel Francisco, again, also from UPMSI, independently developed a flow through setup where water is being pumped up from the surface of the ocean through and then run through the sensors. And so data on temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen and chlorophyll A are transmitted using mobile data. This is currently a system that's developed at Gigiwan and Channel in Bulinao, and the data is also stored in a database. So these sensor systems uh, are still uh, being worked on and uh, being improved on. So at the local scale, site-specific early warning models can be used if real-time data is available for a site. So currently um, we've developed a model for Bolinao Anda, and this makes use of random forest algorithm, which is a machine learning approach that forecasts the probability of uh, shellfish ban or uh, and a fish scale. So the model is linked to the real-time sensor data from Bolinao. And here in this image, you see an example of a forecast from uh, last July 16, 2021 for fish scale at medium probability and shellfish toxicity at low probability. So right now it's running and we're currently observing the performance of this system. But putting what I've shown so far together, we have the following technologies in this early warning system. First is the real-time ocean observation data coming from sensors deployed in the field and satellite images. These are fed and stored into the second component, the database and informatics system that also houses historical data from our labs and the program partners. So these various data sets were standardized and the system allows for uploading and automated storing of this information into the database. So there are also two models. So the one is the large scale satellite image based model C hubs, while the second one is a site specific one using the real time uh, sensor data on site. And these information are disseminated online and ideally to the relevant agencies and communities. So please note that currently the more operational system is the one located at uh, Bulinao in Pangasinan. And these information and tools are accessible through the, what we call Hub Hub of observation and informatics system. So please uh, feel free to visit this system at this URL, hubhub.philhubs.net, or you can scan this QR code so you can be, um, you can go immediately to the site. So this informatic system serves literally as a hub for environmental, biological, and model-derived information related to HABs and general water quality issues. So a key aspect of the program and the development of the early warning system is the engagement of the community and stakeholders from the start of the program. The participatory Patori HAB risk assessment activity was able to enrich HAB risk knowledge in itself is a capacity building effort through information sharing and affirming the local knowledge and capacities. And it also serves as a foundation to develop community actions to help mitigate HAB risks. 
So from this exercise, the communities themselves came up with suggested mitigation measures, namely strengthening alternative livelihood options so that they are not as impacted by HAB events, considering HABs as an event that allows for a state of calamity to be called, and or having measures for financial aid during such events. So having a plan similar to disaster preparedness for HABs is also a, a, a potential measure and ensuring that communities also have access to the information and technologies. Unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we admittedly have had setbacks on more active engagements with the communities. And this has really brought into fore the difficulties in communication and internet access for them. So we've just begun the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And the call is for the science we need for the ocean we want. And we have been challenged to deliver this within 10 years. The ocean we want is a clean, healthy, and resilient, productive, predicted, safe, accessible, and inspiring and engaging ocean. So though the system I presented here is still in its infancy with many challenges ongoing and still to be tackled, this I think is a step forwards and it's a push to improve the Philippines capacity for ocean observation and to bring this together with better understanding of ocean hazards and threats to help attain that ocean we want and where society has the capacity to understand current and future ocean conditions as well as have open access to data, information and technologies. So thank you very much for your time and for uh, the support in funding from Picard and uh, many other types of um, support from our other collaborators. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Iniguez. So I think we are ready for our 10 minute question for our second batch of speakers. And after the 10, minute, 10 minutes, uh, maybe we could open the floor uh, for all speakers again. So there might be some other uh, question for the first set of speakers. Okay, so there is no question from the chat box. So I would encourage the, our participants who uh, write their question if you don't want to raise your hand and ask a, pers a question uh, personally. So to get us moving, uh, maybe my first question is something that is for uh, Junimi and Alep, uh, uh, something uh, because this is related to the observation of uh, Junimi, wherein the system is high in nutrient and low in uh, oxygen. Is this right? No. So I, I don't know if this is already some kind of an early warning that there is something in the system happening. And maybe for Dr. Iniguez, uh, if you have this kind of condition, high nutrient, low oxygen, does it always mean to say that there is some kind of an algal bloom or this could be uh, something else? Go on maybe then. we'll start with Junimi, please. Okay. So the... Um... There was one instance when the, the site experienced uh, har harmful algal bloom. So it was uh, declared a snow fishing area for crustaceans and, and mollusks. And uh, actually the results cannot be conclusive because we just did it like once a month. So I think BFAR is doing um, regular monitoring. That's why they are the authorized uh, agency to declare the area as uh, if it has like harmful algal bloom or, or what. So red tide uh, warnings usually come from uh, BFAR because of their regular monitoring. And I think the increasing um, number of uh, um, oyster farms in, in the site contributed a lot to the um, degrading environmental conditions. So for the past six years that we've been going back and forth to the area, we've seen how the, the bay uh, became very crowded with uh, structures for uh, oyster settlement. And lately, like uh, two years ago, I've heard like the 
declining spotfall. That's why they had to um, culture uh, mussel instead of oysters because they don't get much uh, larval settlement as compared with the previous years. Okay, thank you. Maybe Alec could share I, something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Actually, yes, ma'am, we were actually working with the, uh, well, Sapian Bay, which is the ne next door to Batan. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that area got, it, it's rare, it was rare that it had the uh, hub, I think it was 2015, 2016, two years yeah. ago. And then after that, there was, the there's been nothing. But um, yeah, Mikey, it's actually interesting. I mean, for specific type of hubs, like the toxic hubs for pyridinium, High nutrient is not necessarily equated to <laughs> their bloom. So mm -hmm. it depends on the species. But for example, with the Alexandrium, it might be more correlated, which isn't found in other sites. Um, so uh, we have this, we have this um, idea that pyridinium has a very, you know, they, they have quite different nutrient requirements. So, so pyridinium is okay with the less eutrophicated areas while Alexandrium is fine with Manila Bay and Bulinao. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, but for, for the dissolve oxygen, uh, we have to be careful with, um, in, in, with monitoring um, and assigning fish scales to, to the, to if it's HABs or, or not, because fish scales can also happen in low oxygen and low oxygen is from, you know, if it's, it can also occur if it's warmer temperature, with regardless of if there was a bloom or not. So that's why monitoring is very important. <laughs> okay, thank you both. And uh, Gus, if you would allow me my last question to Dr. Baria. Uh, yeah, uh, I think you have a very nice slide there showing gravid corals, no? And, and I don't know, because your, your slide was showing that you have some kind of a destructive sampling to show that they are gravid. So is this always the case or is there some kind of a gross morphological feature outside that you could say it is gravid or not? So if it's the case that you are doing destructive sampling, so are you doing that every year to know when they are fertile that you could say that it is on the fifth year or the sixth year and maybe not on the second year or the uh, third year? Yeah, it, the, the sampling is really destructive. Yeah, that's why it's really good to monitor. Now that we have established the timing of coral spawning is around three to five days after full moon in the months of May. So we don't actually uh, fracture all the coral colonies that we collected. It's just a subsample. And then in future, we will no longer be needing to, to fracture it because we know the timing. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, Van. Gas, maybe yes. you have other questions. Well, well, there is a question from the, the chat box. So this is from Lowell for, for a letter who says it's a great talk. And he asks, you equated hubs with red tides, which are microalgal blooms. Do you continue to foresee more primary microalgal blooms in the future? Or would there be possible to have macroalgal blooms as well in the context of the Philippines or Southeast Asia. Uh, thank you for the uh, comment and question. So uh, great, Mikey and JV are here <laughs> for the yeah, def, ma, ma, macroalgal blooms. Yes, I think that's uh, very possible. My, I think I'm not entirely so sure about uh, occurrences here, but um, definitely, for example, like, that, that's happened in the Ulva ones in yeah. China and and uh, I think here is maybe Ling, Lingbia, although that's more Sayano. Yeah. To cut you briefly, Alep, I think there I I, I observe a macroalgal bloom in Gigiwan in uh, uh, and this is mostly Kaulerpa. So there were tons of Kaulerpa in Gigiwan in during uh, what time of the year was that? March, April, uh, yeah. So it, it does happen. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Sorry. Mm -hmm. That's okay. So yeah, so, so there. <laughs> it's definitely possible. And it's something we need to uh, watch out for and how it, it, it can impact the ecosystems as well.
And I think that there's a question from Irene Rodriguez, so you can turn your monitor on and you can ask it uh, live. Uh, good day, everyone. My, my question is for Van. Van, um, for the sexual um, way of uh, producing corals, will this have any impact on genetic diversity in the long run? Yes, it will have. Actually, uh, the fertilization experiment that we did was really exploratory to be able to detect if there is uh, a significant change in terms of fertilization success for uh, relative species or relative colonies. So F1 by F1, uh, yeah, we, we actually thought that maybe if they're relatives, then the fertilization success or survival would be low. But um, apparently, uh, we haven't seen it. But it's a really good question for, for this type of uh, research that we are doing. Because we don't want, uh, we want a multi, uh, not just a multi-species, but we want, uh, we don't want to use the same cohort of colonies all throughout. It, there, it might definitely have an effect on the population. Yeah, and will, would that have an influence on the genetic pool of the symbionts as well? Uh, that I have no idea yet. That's something that we can explore. Yeah, Definitely. thanks. And uh, I think Cecilia would like to ask a question. Uh, so, is it, uh, so it's Rachel who is asking the question. Hello, good, uh, good afternoon now. So the question is for Van, so I think it's more of a follow-up. So to the question of um, Dr. Rodriguez. So our uh, uh, first thing, um, I guess just for perspective. So what is the perspective, what is um, the timeline for, uh, you mentioned you're growing these 12 year old um, colonies already. So to restore a reef to some extent, just uh, out of curiosity. So how many years, uh, how many years will that, um, Will that take to restore a particular patch of uh, reef to some, uh, I wouldn't say functionality, I guess, structural complexity initially? Yeah, it depends. No? For if you want a multi-species, for example, uh, a cropper species, the fast growing can uh, be reproductive at three years old for this massive coral. So the reproduction is around five, five to six years old. And I think we have to consider their survival. Their survival on the field is quite low, it's relatively low. And uh, we are seeing that they're around 10 to 20% survival mm -hmm. for these massive corals. But for the fast growing corals, the survival is really low. It's less than 5%. So it really, it takes time and it depends on the, the site really. If the water quality in the site is good, and there's no prevailing threats that uh, can contribute to coral degradation, then probably I can say five to 10 years, that's possible. But in areas that are degraded, it can be really challenging. So I, I've just shown you a good picture that's with a good cover. But in fact, if uh, not all of our coral bummies uh, had a high survival. So yeah, I hope that answered uh, your question. Michelle, yes. thank you. Thank you. So if I may just uh, just a follow up again also just to put things in perspective. So is there any um uh, rationalization of um or prioritization of sites in terms of um these uh, sites uh would be more strategic for restoration given that uh the rate of um uh degradation or coral loss um, it's not so. It's not so big, such that restoration is a viable option. Yeah, uh, we have not demonstrated it yet, but I because we've been working in Bulinao and Bulinao and you know Pangasinan is quite relatively degraded. But I think if we will do it in sites like Tawi Tawi or somewhere in Palawan with good water quality, I think uh, that would be possible. 
So it's really good to design an experiment where you can look at the strategic locations with multiple stressors and probably you consider uh, different levels of uh, water quality. And then with that, uh, we can identify and, you know, at least we have a criteria, basic criteria uh, to maximize uh, restoration success. Okay, thank you. And uh, I think JV has a question. I just have a follow up for um, to answer ni um, Boss Alet kanina about sa macroalgae bloom, no? So actually, with Ulva, um, uh, we we have a um, little baseline information regarding um, um, Ulva blooming uh, forming species. Uh, so that is why with the current project that we are involved, we will try to develop a um, a website that uh, people. Um, all over the country could able to report if there's a possible um, bloom forming species of ulva. So this is part of my Balik Scientist program and also part of the DOST funded ulva project. So that's it. Thank you. Oh, and Junami has a question. Yeah, no. Uh, regarding the macroalgal uh, bloom, I observed one time in Sikogon Island that was sometime in May. There was a bloom of... Uh, Ulva uh, reticularis or something. Reticulata. Yeah, reticulata, yeah. And I even tried using it as feed for, for abalone because we're using uh, Gracilariopsis citroclada as abalone feed. So I compared it with um, Ulva reticulata for a while, but the abalone feed on, on, on Ulva but did not grow actually. <laughs> Oh. So you can record that there was a bloom of Ulva reticulata sometime in, in May. In yeah, actually, there is already reported in Cebu and in, um, I forgot the other one, in Mindanao. So yeah, there's very few, but um, if we could able to document some sightings, we could able to have a, a, a bigger picture where could Ulva um, could thrive um, if they will produce bloom or, or what. Thank you, ma'am, for that, Ito. I have a follow-up maybe for a discussion regarding algal bloom. May it be microalgae or macroalgae? Uh, is there a, a, a measure or a way of quantifying or saying that it becomes uh, harmful or it becomes a, a noise a, a noisance or, or something? No, because bloom naturally occur. So wherever it is, if you have uh, in the cold temperate, in the polar or tropical area, when environmental condition is suitable, bloom naturally occur. And when does it become harmful or when become, it becomes uh, something that uh, could exhibit negative impact or something? Not, I, I think, I do not know, Alep, if there is already some kind of a proxy or whatever you could say, this bloom is now uh, not usual so this is already unusual so when do we start reporting because bloom like i said bloom occur yeah definitely yeah yeah it, it can be it's a natural it can be a natural phenomenon in in uh, many instances but well for i think for i'm not sure about the macroalgae side as much but microalgae wise there is a there is more of an established uh uh, thinking on when it becomes uh, uh, not good. <laughs> so, for example, you know, for tox toxic blooms, the the main uh, criteria for at least for regulatory purposes is that the toxicity in the shellfish reaches a certain threshold, which is like if it's uh, greater than or equal to sixty micrograms per one hundred gram shellfish meat grade. So that automatically means shellfish ban uh, and harvest. Mm -hmm. But and then for and then you know if you get fish kills <laughs> yeah. because of a bloom, then automatically of course that's bad. So for mackerel, um, and then there are the nuisance ones that are that's more uh, not so much here, but in other countries where you have, um, which affects the recreation or tourism mm. industries because they have to close beaches. So mm -hmm. that might be more applicable here. For example, if you have the sargassum, yeah. um, and other um and also in Halos, actually, the, that's washing up on the beaches and yeah. causing a lot of yeah. uh, debris and decomposition. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, so that 
and that could close the beach. So that would be a nuisance bloom. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we should have some kind of a, I don't know, this should be a discussion among different stakeholders or different uh, uh, academics, no? because I think we should set up a threshold or uh, as some kind of a measure, because we could not say that when there's a bloom, then it is already something negative, because it does happen. Sargassum does bloom, different seagrass has bloom, or, or yeah, uh, also macroalgae, especially those that are seasonal. For example, when hydroclatrus becomes seasonal, you could really see large bloom of hydroclatrus. No, so yeah, so I think JV that is a, a good a good uh, uh, initiative, but I think we should be very careful in educating uh, uh, the locals or uh, different stakeholders, because we should not think that when there's a bloom, this is already something negative or it will be perceived negatively. Yes, Mike. Actually, um, um, for now, wala pa kami criteria. When can we say it's a bloom? Um, that is why we're trying to do a baseline um, information first and in doing in um, coastal um, area of Batanga. So then we could um, see how it will work. Maybe differentiate. It can bloom, but then when is it harmful? <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And when it becomes a nuisance, no? Yes. And when it is harmful, yeah, uh, all these things, yeah. Okay, I think, I think... Uh, There's one more question, a... actually. Yeah, they, yeah. They give it to Irene. Uh, hi, again. I'm just chiming in here, speaking of halves. Yeah, so I, I'm just curious. Do, do we have uh, efforts in the Philippines to look at um, uh, toxins being just available in the air? Because coastal areas, and you see that the halves and toxins may be carried in the air um i think because the the ones that are the the species that causes that is karenia they don't typically have the blooms um but there might be there there might have been a few in in bolinao but it's not typical so yeah we haven't really checked on aerosol kind of type of blooms thanks just briefly, maybe time check. So we are five to half past 12. Mm. So we are starting some kind of an interesting conversation. So <laughs> we, we might as well open this to everyone. So if you have questions from the first set of speakers, I think JV already, uh, 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 I mean, the study of JV is also somehow related to, to uh, uh, Aleph and to Junimi. So maybe we could now start integrating maybe Mount Cecilia is the the uh, uh, <laughs> outlier here but outlier <laughs> Mount Cecilia here yes <laughs> okay so go ahead so maybe we could have another 10 15 minutes yes, that would be great. discussion yes. gas maybe we you could facilitate thank you sure sure yes well actually can I just start because it is a very interesting thread because you you could see that the, uh, I was very pleased that Alet presented a big picture of uh, well a, a, a vision that uh, is not only for for the Philippines but worldwide of, of really valuing our oceans that they're not just at the moment we have a big challenge because most of the world considers the oceans as sewers but to really claw back so that the, you know the, this restoration effort which provides for life to be habitable is, is so important and it, it's wonderful to see all these different uh, aspects you know these these different parts of the mosaic you know it's fantastic to see van's work in, in restoration and then obviously the hubs and, and also the, the other spectrum with with the uh, well the nutrition in, in the in the uh, polythorians and, and also with the oysters but it really is this spectrum of looking at well, what is what is the impact of humans and the built environment on our oceans, and and how do we create the possibility that you know our our, our cities, if you like, which are the main uh, producers of impact on on our oceans, can can really be made accountable and be that, that we we have the mechanisms to make sure that we claw back the, the viability of our uh, ecosystems, the aquatic ecosystems. 
So uh, very, very, very interesting uh, series of uh, interventions here. So I don't know if, if someone wants to sort of pitch into that. Well, actually, can I can I make an off the cuff comment to Junimi because I was very pleased to see all, all that work in oysters because I, I migrated to, to Australia forty six years ago and the last meal, if you like, I had in the Philippines before I left as a seventeen year old was to have a big big dish of oysters from Dumangas and I have never had oysters any more since I've been going back to the Philippines but to see how pristine it used to be in, in, in those days. Uh, you know, that, that was a, such a highlight. And then to see now that you, you see this, this vast over-exploitation in, in many ways of habitats means that, uh, well, people are just putting so much pressure on these ecosystems and then knowing that there's the constant disturbance. Uh, and, and so I just want to know, are there any triggers that allow, well, create withholding periods for the harvest of oysters because certainly here in Australia, you know, even for just a, a very little uh, disturbance of heavy rainfall from let's say uh, farmlands that, that go into these uh, estuaries where they have oysters, they, they, they cannot sell oysters for two weeks. Do, do, do you have those kinds of procedures in uh, the Philippines, uh, for example? They only stop i think anywhere in the philippines they stop harvesting or selling of uh shellfishes during when the the area is declared by bifar as uh having uh red tide or habs so that's that's the only time the the oysters will not go to the market actually sir my one of my study sites is is the mangas mm. For, for this project. So I, I had three study sites. One is in Ahoy, the other one is in Dumangas, and the other one is in New Washington, Aklan. But the sites in Dumangas and, and Ahoy are like um, in the middle of um, a village or a community. So there, there are many um, houses or residents Whereas the site in New Washington, it's like in uh, in the middle of uh, mangroves and ponds, so far away from from uh, residential areas. But still, in Iloilo, the mangas is a place to go if you want to get oysters. I remember that. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, once lockdown lifts, we can we can do these things. Yeah, but, but the, the only thing that prevents oysters or other shellfishes from, from being sold is the, the declaration of BIFAR of that particular area as uh, having a harmful algal bloom. So aside from that, nothing. Mm -hmm. They Thank sell you. them in, in different sizes from the smallest to the largest. Any other question between or among speakers or maybe from our audience? Participants? Mikey, may I? Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, I, I'm just curious as well. This one is addressed to Jimmy. Would you know if we are able to export oysters? Very good question. Um, I hope I, it, <laughs> go ahead. I, I don't know of, of any company or 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 even the government uh, or government agency or anything that ex exports oysters because of our problem on E. coli content. Like most of our oyster beds are classified as uh, um, B or C. So the only thing we can export oysters if the site is classified as class A for growing oysters and there are limits to the, the E. coli count. So we cannot meet that uh, requirement. Uh, yeah, okay, so um, following that line of thinking, 
we are not able to export because of that classification of where they are being grown, but we are selling them locally. And the same implications in terms of health. So, I, I mean, yeah. yeah. So, you know where where this discussion is going and uh, I, I, just, I, I just want to to uh, see the direction, how, how we can change the policy and ensure that really we are also protecting uh, mm. our own people. Exactly. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Actually, as part of that big program, there's a team working on um, relaying and depuration process for the oysters to become uh, more clean or depurated before being sold. So it's a different uh, a group that uh, did the, this uh, uh, experiment. So I think they have established a depuration process and, and relaying systems for the oysters to be uh, more acceptable. But I think we're used to eating oysters with uh, quite uh, high levels of equal <laughs> So It's safe if they're cooked. So, so just don't eat uh, raw oysters. <laughs> just make sure to cook them. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that. Uh, anyway, I'll just put it out there. If you ever need someone to work with um, uh, determination of trace metals, um, yes, yeah, I'm yeah. here. Thank you, ma'am. It's so important, yeah. Mom Giselle has a question. She raised her hand. Go ahead, mom. Sorry. You know, I'm planning for my talk tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so many you know, places to participate in this conference and that, but I've been listening and it's so nice to hear, see everyone and hear everyone here. And, um, well, Mike is aware, Van's aware, and of course, Irene of, um, you know, this plan to have an integrative um, uh, culture somewhere, uh, you know, uh, in one of our uh, respective sites. And um, some time back, uh, Terry and I went to Mulanay, you know, Quezon, and um, there's this like huge uh, mangrove coastline there. And uh, the first thing that um, Terry said was, um, hmm, this is perfect for uh, sea cucumber farming. And um, well, actually the land belongs to, um, the late NAST academician, uh, Remy Alveda, who was our host of that uh, uh, well, tour. And so um, recall that we came up with a proposal, Irene and um, Van, to try to get some of these projects going. And uh, at another uh, time, we also thought about how some seaweeds could be used um, as um, feed, um, I don't know, um, additives uh, for sea cucumbers and other invertebrates. So um, Irene and Van and um, and Rachel, would you please comment on this? Is this something worth pursuing? I know it's a big question, but um, you know, in light of uh, what uh, we have stopped um, for now, um, Mikey in MSI, we have not moved forward the UNESCO proposal that you prepared in 2019. See, and the deadline is uh, coming 2021, uh, submitted in the new format. So what do you think, um, Rachel? Uh, so thank you, Ma'am Giselle, for the comment. I guess I can um, comment in uh, in terms of um, what I know of the sea cucumbers, no, um, because this is um, actually being run by um, Dr. Annette Menes, and a very large component of um, that um, plan is really uh, strong collaborations with um, regional and local partners. So her um, uh, her current um, ACR project, for example, um, involves um, a CIF deck. Uh, GDFI, um, MSU, um, because these are um, the institutions on site who know their, um, I guess, the, their backyards best. 
no in in terms of uh, implementing um, these um, culture culture strategies from uh, from rearing all the way to selection of sites for um, for grow out so um, yeah so that's my uh, um, my, my my perspective is really mostly second hand because what I really do is the genetics aspect so I provide the the um, analysis for uncovering the genetic diversity to support those um, initiatives, both for aquaculture and for um, management of natural populations. Okay, thanks. So I recall um, Terry saying that 40 uh, hectares in front of the mangrove would be perfect. It's not super intensive farming. And my particular interest, of course, would be the the protection of the mangroves because we study the habitats, inhabitants of the mangroves, which are the shipworms, uh, which harbor a lot of uh, bacteria, okay, shipworm bacteria that are prolific producers of um, uh, bioactive compounds. So, um, well, Cecil, that's a connect with the terrestrial, okay? I mean, it's. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's but go. of course, it's mangrove wood. Yeah. Anyway, I think we have to continue thinking about this, Aleta and uh, my, Mikey and Irene. And Irene would, of course, uh, you know, keep thinking about the, uh, you know, the, the chem chemicals and the biochemicals, uh, the analytical aspect of these uh, studies. No? So anyway, thanks so much for this very enriching uh, session. Thank you, Rachel. There are a few comments in the chat box from uh, Ms. Maria Nia Santos regarding the uh, Code of Good Aquaculture Practices for Oyster and Mussels. So apparently the Philippine oyster cannot pass the requirement of the export market. So we should strive or we could strive to really, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, satisfy the, the requirement because this is a huge market in Europe. So I just remember the last conference I had in, in France. Oh, whole time of the conference, they were serving fresh oyster it's with it's some it's white it's wine, red wine. Oh, it was, it was, it was nice. No? And yeah. And, and hopefully we could eat something like Philippine oyster somewhere in Europe soon. When is that? I do not know. That. Is there any other more comments, maybe feedbacks? Mom, uh, Roman, Romana? Uh, yes, are, I'm yeah, Wang. Yes, I'm yeah. Wang from CIFDEC. I'm a colleague of Junimi. Uh, I'd just like to, I, I think I made the comment before Nia. So there is this Philippine national standards for shellfish, apart from the technical working group, am I correct? Anyway, so some CFDEC people are sitting in all of those uh, PNS uh, technical working groups together with people from the Bureau of Fisheries. Although there's, of course, there's not, there's no assurance as yet. Uh, it's a matter of just um, maybe compliance on the part of those producing those aquatic uh, commodities. So I also, think second the, the comment that uh, it doesn't pass export standards uh, as regards the oyster and there's uh, also one thing about uh, I think what we are able to export is if you're familiar with the oyster sauce so mm -hmm. but there's some problems with there as well as to the source uh, I think uh, there's one brand that's not being uh, exported at the present time to Europe because of uh, traceability uh, issue. So th this is just to add information uh, on the safety of eating oysters that we have in the Philippines. Thank you. Thank you, mom. Okay, if we don't have more question, maybe guys, shall we close the session? I think we can, yes. It, well, certainly, it has been a very rich and stimulating uh, two hours, two and a half hours. And 
you know, I, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm so pleased with the number of uh, aquatic people. So I think next pass, we, we have to encourage our terrestrial colleagues to contribute so that we, we get a wider picture of biodiversity. <laughs> but uh, I think the, this begs the question when we, when we go to the committee of PASE, well, is, is, you know, our, our natural environment is big enough to have uh, both land and sea. And, and, uh, but uh, yeah, I think it, it's, a, it's a very good discussion to, to see, well, how, how do we highlight our biodiversity? Because you know, certainly th this opportunity to, to contribute so much of our, our marine ecosystems, certainly for me personally, has been a highly enriching time. So I think uh, we, we've been requested to have a group photo, isn't it? <laughs> Before we... Uh... Yes, we could do that. So I think we request everyone to turn the... We could request everyone to turn their yeah. camera on. And uh, and someone has to take the photo. <laughs> so I, I don't know whether Richmond does that or... Uh, Richmond previously volunteered. Maybe if he could do that again. Richmond, are you still here? Uh, yes, sir. Thank um, you, Paul. Maybe request everyone to please turn on their cameras, their videos. Thank you. Okay, on my mark. One, two, three, smile. Okay. More One more po. Just to be safe. One last po. Okay. One, two, three po. One, two, three, smile. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, me. everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Have a nice lunch. Yes. Yeah. 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 Encourage everyone to join the other concurrent sessions over the next two days. And uh, yeah. it's been yeah. a wonderful start. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Bye. You.